All right. Let's chat for a minute, shall we? Um, if you're like me, you've been really weirded out in the last couple of days. Um, I've been through a lot, but you, you don't really seem to understand what you're going through until you're in the middle of it in pretty much any situation in my experience. Um, so um, I, I, my, one of my favorite books in the world is The Stand by Stephen King. And uh, don't read it now. Never, ever watch the miniseries because it's the worst thing in the world. Um, but don't read it now. But there's a, a virus issue in the, in the first part of the book. And I, I've read this thick book or in Kindle thickness um, more than 20 times in my life. I started reading when I was when I was uh, 20 and living in Italy. And it's just amazing how quickly things can spread. Um, so hi, puppy. Liz is here to join us on the vlog. Um, so uh, if, if you have not started getting into habits, it's going to be a really important thing to do. Um, I was at Mad Gym last weekend, and I told myself, you're allowed to go, but you'll be washing your hands and scrubbing and enjoying that scrubbing experience. It's not I have to get through this to get back to somewhere, but as much as I enjoy dance or as much as I enjoy walking to get water uh, at a convention, I'm going to enjoy washing my hands. So I did it, and it worked really well. Not touching my face. Um, success. So far, um, I usually rest my hands on my face all the time. I'm, you know, like itching, scratching. Um, when I've had really bad moments in my life, I've bitten my nails. Even when it's not bad moments, but just irritating moments in my life, I bite the cuticles. I haven't done that since I left from Mad Jam, so I'm pretty happy with that. So I woke up feeling much better this morning, jumped in the hot tub as I usually do. Um, and, uh, Oh, the stand. I was going to tell you something specific about the stand, but let me make sure this is recording. Still recording. Okay, so the stand. So in the stand, there's um, Ray Flowers is, is one of the characters in the beginning, and, and he's a, um, a radio host. And even though the government has shut down all the radio stations or they're, they're making them read the, the fake news, if you will, at the time, um, which was there is no virus, there's no virus, you know, um, and he locks himself in his radio booth and he uh, he just starts talking about what he sees on the street and how people are dying and bodies are piled up. This is not happening, by the way. This isn't Stephen King's The Stand. And they ruined it in that miniseries. Um Really good cast, but like Kathy Bates is not Ray Flowers. I'm sorry. So Stephen King, you're a genius. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm alone here on my property um, outside of Portland, Oregon. And I've just set up my vlog studio lighting, turned everything on, hit record. And now I feel like I'm Ray Flowers, just like on my own talking to everyone because I don't think I'll be leaving my property to go into civilization for the next month. Um, I'm all set for everything as far as I can tell. And if I want to go hiking or, you know, do other outdoor stuff, that's west, uh, east of me. And there's three pretty easy access on the mountain. So uh, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my my day. So yeah, uh, Robin came over, we played some ping pong. Ping pong uh, got me through some really rough spots in my life. And especially being in the professional dance world for teaching for 21 years now. I started in 98. Um, but the the arts field in a competitive realm can be really harsh on you uh, when you're told that your art is not good enough in a competition realm, which is something that lots of people don't understand is it's, um, it, yeah, things can be political, uh, but it's just someone's opinion about your art. So, and we, as long as we all strive to better ourselves and better our art, then that's what it should really be about. But it's hard to see that in the moment of. Uh, but I'm getting sidetracked. Coffee. Anyway, so ping pong, very therapeutic for me. I love losing. I love winning. Um, I love just playing. 
And now that I have a month at home, um, I have a ping pong robot it does not play against me, just spits balls in like programmable sequences. I'm really looking forward to training with that every day. So Robin Robinson, watch out for next time you're over. Um, so anyway, Robin came over, we walked around the house, talked about ideas for landscape and, and uh, stuff in the house that he's helped me with. And then we came in here and played ping pong. We're keeping our, you know, we scrubbed up together, um, keeping, you know, full table width apart <laughs> when we're playing ping pong. Um, but anyway, it was, it was a really good therapeutic day. Um, and I, I did win this time, but that's not usual, Robin. Anyway, then I ran into town into Gresham. And the reason for that was a new habit that I'm getting into here. I've been around guns my whole life. Um, I grew up target shooting with my family. I'm not a hunter. Um, I'm not opposed to it for food purposes, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, yeah, I've always been self-defense and target shooting for the sport of target shooting. My dad was really into that. So I was really into that as a kid. In fact, I could only close my right eye as a kid. So my mom, who's an amazing artist and a seamstress, she made me an eye patch to cover, still not touching my face, cover my left eye so I could train myself to sight with my right eye when we were shooting. So anyway, um, huge, uh, huge fan of gun safety and, and understanding guns and their purpose. So my fear and why I haven't been sleeping well for the last couple of nights was that um, my thought now is I live uh, half an hour east of Portland, Oregon. And as soon as if we catch up to Italy and if there are um, if there is a statewide quarantine or self ban, my the worst fear to me is not getting this virus, but is protecting myself uh, against the meth heads that might come outside of Portland and like. Yeah, try and take over a well stocked like house for a month assuming that police and fire and, and uh, EMR will be too busy to like follow up on all the calls. Anyway, so right here, this is, I picked this up today. I replay, I got an extra rifle uh, just in case there's hunting for food necessary. Uh, you might say that that's way overkill and I would agree with you right now, but if it's three months down the road and you want some venison, you let me know and I'm half an hour east of Portland and I got deer on my land. I'd rather shoot them with my camera and not a gun, but you know, if we have to eat, but I don't think it's going to come to that. At least I hope not. Anyway, so um, I'm now carrying this with me at all times on my property. It's never going to leave my side. And uh, I have a, a super amazing flashlight as well that's right by my door. Um, and I've, I've started locking stuff. I lock, like right now, the studio is locked while I'm upstairs. So if someone tries to get in, they won't be able to. Um, so, and then uh, if you haven't hit the bank yet, I went to the bank uh, while I was waiting for them to call in my name and fingerprints and everything uh, for the gun purchases. And if you don't have any cash, it might be a good idea. Not that, you know, I mean, who knows, but if let's say there is a computer virus that wipes out a whole bunch of stuff and um, credit cards aren't working and you may not have any checks or checks are no good, cash is, is always going to be good. When cash isn't good, we have a lot more problems to worry about. So I took out some cash at the bank as well. Um, so recommendation um, in Portland, the Chase Bank that is at the grocery store was like a line a couple hours long um, to get out money. And so I went to an actual branch and there was uh, there were six employees and no people. So that was that was a, a good five minutes of my day. Anyway, now I made it home um, and um, I'm now ready to to get back to some artwork. So um, every time I vlog, I'm gonna have a few different things here. This is my coffee and disposable mug for the day. But um, I wanna talk about three things today in no particular order. Guns and Roses, Don't Cry. This is a cassette tape. This survived the fire uh, as all of my trophies did. I lost one routine outfit, the sunflower from Plants vs. Zombies. I miss that. Raina Storer made that, and then I miss you, Raina. I hope you're doing well in Los Angeles. Um, but my trophy survived uh, the fire because the studio survived. And um, Guns N' Roses Don't Cry. I won this in seventh grade. Uh, born in 78, so whatever that year that was, like 81. Um, I danced uh, my first dance competition. It was a, a jam dance battle in junior high. And... Uh, I danced like in sync 
and New Kids on the Block. And I, I was learning to dance by watching the Fly Girls and In Living Color every Sunday. It was such a good show. So J-Lo and the Fly Girls, I would dance with them in the kitchen. I would dance in my in the house I grew up in the kitchen while my parents watched Jeopardy in the other room. And then uh, I would run back and watch Jeopardy with them and then go back and watch In Living Color. Back and forth. Anyway, Guns N' Roses, Don't Cry. This was the trophy I won in seventh grade in the dance-off jam circle style for solo dancing. This is when I met Frankie Manning. So this is really cool. Tina Morales, who is one of the most amazing promoters and human beings in the Lindy Hop world. Um, she works with the Frankie Foundation. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything about this because of the chat thread I'm on. Well, this won't be edited, but let's just say, hey, look, Tina Morales is an awesome person and Frankie Manning, rest in peace, brother. Um, Man, I was so young. Anyway, this is Frankie's 82nd birthday. Then this. So as we talk about good years and bad years in our lives, um, I feel like some, some years are equally bad and good in different regards, right? We all go through that. So 2003, this is the Champions Tribecta Award from the New York Lindy Hop Open when it was run by Carol Frazier. Um, it was an amazing ballroom with like all these this glass wall to look out into the city. Um, and the that event started on a, on a Friday. And I think it was that Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, I was dry, I lived in Beverly Hills and I was driving to the dry cleaner to pick up my, my amazing suits to take back to New York for this event. And uh, I totaled my car, Miata cut across like three lanes of traffic. It was totally their fault. And um, I got into a huge car wreck total of my car. Uh, I did get my dry cleaning and uh, I did fly to New York because at that time I was like, just like Mad Jam last week. I'm like, nothing's going to stop me. I this massive car wreck. Why would I not go compete? I've been training this routine. Um, I'm like, I was killing it in the Lindy Hop world. It was great. So constant pain. Um, flying there was really, really horrible pain. I would dance and then like crawl off the floor. Uh, I won everything that year. It was amazing. Um, Sylvia Sykes and I danced in the Jack and Jill, and I danced with Debbie Gitt, and oh, I can't remember who else, but I won the, the first place in each of the three, I think, so I got this award. Anyway, so that's what uh, I wanted to share with y'all today for the trophies. Now, let's see. Yesterday, I talked a bit about artist mentality and how to survive as an artist, and I was giving some suggestions on what to do as an artist to get started to build your um, your passive income nest. And I didn't mention this yesterday, but passive income, if you're not familiar with the term, it just means you're making money while not doing anything. Um, in the real world uh, arena, you buy a, a stock, right? You buy stock from Starbucks and that stock in theory is making you money. And when you sell that stock, you would get back more money than you put in, or you'll be getting your dividend and, and getting money from something without expending any energy. This is how the wealthiest people make more and more money because they're, they're not actually doing a physical job to get a physical pay. So for the dance instructors, photographers, et cetera, a really good, um, excuse me, really good, um, phrase, if you don't know the, or the term economy of scale, economy of scale. I first learned about it because I was an art history major. I, I didn't really do economics, but I find it fascinating now. But in 2005, um, my friends Earl and Parker asked me to come in and shoot the convention video for Swing Diego. And I said, wow, that sounds great. I'm trying to survive on the circuit. I'll do whatever it takes if I I owned a production company that did instructional videos for myself and other people, but um, I wanted to be everywhere because I wanted a social dance. That was it. So Earl and Parker said, come on in, please, please come shoot the video, but we want to do something with you. Um, and we chatted about uh, being able to bring down the prices of videos because what was happening was you'd go to a dance convention. If you remember these days, this is uh, VHS to DVD years it would take, let's say, two to three months for you to get your your video. And by then, you're like, well, I don't remember my dance. And it was really hard to learn as a dancer. I wanted instant feedback. 
those video sets also cost about 150 bucks for the weekend. Sometimes the video costs more than the weekend itself. It's a separate company, and, you know, however that worked. So, um, so I, I said, yeah, I'll come in and shoot this, but we're, we're going to pretty much give away the videos. I think we charge 25 bucks for them, uh, plus shipping five for national and 10 international. But you get a five DVD set. The turnaround time was three days, three days. I didn't sleep. I committed to this and I edited and edited and authored DVDs and, and was at home with my old assistant, Tara. Hi, Tara Cardinal. And we're like putting DVDs into towers and producing. I'm like, got it done, got it done. Um, but with the economy of scale, we sold several hundred um, copies instead of like at the end of when I stopped shooting conventions. Like I, I was, there's one convention where I sold one copy. I'm like, I'm working 50 hours to make 50 bucks. That doesn't make sense. So how this comes down to you as an artist, um, if the artists are still watching this, is create something that you can sell a lot of. So you can give a private lesson and make, making this up, of course, a hundred bucks for your 50 minutes. You could teach a, a group workshop that you promote and maybe everyone pays 15 bucks and you get 20 people. Maybe you go to a promoter who brings you into a town and you're making a thousand dollars for a weekend where you're teaching X amount of workshops and they're bringing all the people and they're also making money through economy and scale. But then there are the things that you can sell. You take the most amazing dance photo of Frankie Manny when he was alive and everyone wants it, but not many people are going to pay a hundred bucks. Not many people will pay 50 bucks. But would you want a, a nice metal print photo for $15 of, you know, your favorite dancers or, you know, uh, have that photo and you can sell thousands of them. We're talking about a worldwide market now. So economy of scale. If you're a musician um, in this downtime, write some music, get creative. Um, and if it's good and people want to buy it, you can sell that one digital track for a dollar. And if you sell 20,000 copies, uh, minus whatever fees there are, you're making money and you might even be making more money as you'll hopefully find out than when you are grinding it out on the road, teaching one lesson at a time. That's how we impact most of the people in the world is through uh, what can be seen as passive income or through just resources that can reach a wide audience. Um, one of my first times in Thailand, um, Dax and I were talking about Dax Hawk don't know Dax. He's one of the best Lindy Hoppers in the world. His wife, Sarah Breck, who was my assistant and dance partner when she was 18 years old, man. Now they have a couple of kids. Anyway, um, I always said to Dax, if we're in Thailand and we see bootlegged videos, there's always movies and TV shows that are bootlegged. If I ever saw one of my DVDs that someone had printed a million copies and was trying to sell them for two bucks each, I'd be so happy because that would mean that what I am doing is reaching that many people. Would I be upset that I wasn't making uh, all that money? Maybe, but it's more important for me to have my art out there. Um, but that's because I, I started with things like the economy of scale and understanding of financial markets at, a, at an early age. But anyway, um, a few other things to talk about. So that's, that's for the artists to um, get your art out to the masses. And even if it doesn't make you money now, if you're like, well, I'm going to give away uh, three weeks of lessons, teach a live lesson. Maybe you get one person showing up online. Maybe you get a thousand people. If you give it away for free, you show people how good you are as a teacher. You show people your personality. You show people how you handle a class. And if they like you, they're going to come back for more. And then they'll choose to spend that money on you. So it doesn't mean you have to actually uh, charge for everything. You'll, you'll get money back in the long run if what you do is good enough. Um, I'm gonna make sure it's still recording. All right. Well, I think it's uh, cuddle time to be with my puppy. So uh, until next time, stay tuned. <laughs>